Church, how are we doing today? It's good to see everybody. We are finishing up our series on folly today. Uh, the whole month has been focused on foolishness. The title of the series this year, this, this month, is April Fools. As we study out the concept of wisdom for the entire... Are we getting a little bit of reverb here? No? Is that just me? Okay. Um, I got to put a disclaimer on this message, though, right to begin with. Um, you know, in, in our corner of the world, we really like endings that we can wrap up with a night, nice, neat bow. You know, we, we call these cinematic endings, and we are used to television shows and movies, and, and we like a movie at the end of it where all the loops are tied, there, there, there's no unanswered questions, and we love, we love, happy, we love happy endings. Um, as a matter of fact, one of my favorite movies, though, uh, kind of defied this kind of format, and uh, it's a movie by uh, director Christopher Nolan, it's called Inception, it's a very, very popular movie, but at the end of it, there is a spinning top on a table, and that top is supposed to represent the idea that we're not going to tell you what the ending is, all right, it's hanging in the balance, all right, and, and, and there's more to the top than just that, but but, and, and, and there's a lot, there's many people who walk away from that and they are unsatisfied by that ending. They want to know with definitiveness the ending. And you know what? The Bible is not cinematic in its format. The Bible has many untold endings, many, many unfinished endings, many endings that are not satisfying. The, the ending of the book of Judges, for example, is one of my, is one of my favorite endings and it's, and it's it just says this, in those days there was no king and everybody did as they wanted or as they saw fit. And, it was, and that, that followed this horrific story and then that was the end of the book, all right? No happy ending whatsoever. When you go, to, go ahead and open your Bibles to Mark chapter 16, there's actually two endings in the book of Mark, all right? There is what appears to be uh, an original ending and then a redacted ending. And it seems like the author went back, or one of the biblical authors went back, and they added to what was, what was the original ending. And uh, both endings are scriptural. You know, there's, there, there's, no, there's no conflict in them. Um, but the original ending looked like it took place in verse 8, okay? And this is after all the women. You know, Jesus has been killed. They go to the tomb. The tomb is, is, is empty. Um, there's an angel there seems to be an angel, and then verse 8 was the original ending of the book of Mark. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. End of the story of Jesus. <laughs> and that feels like a very unsatisfying ending. Like, wait, wait, they didn't tell anybody? They just took that and they went home and that's it? And, 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 and you're, left, you're left going, how can that be the ending, okay? Now, I'm, I'm belaboring all of this. This isn't even the point of the sermon. I'm telling you this because the end of the sermon today is going to be very unsatisfying, <laughs> okay? I struggled to find a good ending. I stayed up late. I woke up early. And in the end, uh, there is no end. And so at some point, I am going to simply walk off the stage because I have nothing more to say. All right, so you can just wait to see when that happens. It'll be interesting for all of us. <laughs> there's always a temptation in a speaker to want to like have a great ending where there's, a, there's applause and there's a crescendo and there's people in tears. And I'm just going to leave you slightly confused today, I think. <laughs> the title of today's sermon is April Fool's Unseen. Unseen, all right, as in blind. And, you know, one of the things that we know from the entirety of scripture, one of the things that the Bible says about fools is that they are blind. They do not see. But what's worse is that they think they see. They are blind, but they think that they can see. You know, in reference to the disciples that informed him after he offended the Pharisees, Jesus one time said this in Matthew 15, 14, leave them, the Pharisees, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. That word pit is probably a reference to the pit outside of Jerusalem, Gehenna, um, which was where a lot of refuse was thrown. It was also where 
uh, you know, pagan kings within the Judaic history sacrificed children to the god Baal or Molech. It was also a metaphorical reference to the idea of hell. And so he says, if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit, both will fall into hell. You know, Jesus refers to the religious leaders as blind several times, especially in the Gospel of Matthew. You go to Matthew 23, and you will see the seven woes. And Jesus does not mince words about what he thinks about those who are in authority who are blind. All right? Um, But he does go on to qualify what he means by blind later. Because he doesn't want to confuse the innocence of those who are literally blind with the guilt of those who choose to be blind. In John chapter 9, verse 40, some Pharisees who were with him, with Jesus, heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Because Jesus was talking about light and darkness, he's talking about He's talking about those who walk in the darkness. He's talking about blindness. And, and the Pharisees are like, what, are we, are we also those who are blind? This is also after he just healed a blind man on the Sabbath. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. What Jesus compares to folly is the type of blindness that is self-chosen. Now, what does that mean? It means you're not ignorant. You have all the information you need to have understanding. You have the the opportunity to comprehend fully what's before you, but you ignore it. You willfully avoid knowing. And instead, you choose blindness. That was the case with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. They were learned. They had every opportunity to know and understand who the Messiah and what the Messiah was. They had made assumptions about what they thought they knew, assumptions that benefited themselves and their ideology, and they didn't want to know anything that would threaten those benefits. It sounds so insidious when we talk about it in the context of the Pharisees, because we're all like, oh, the Pharisees. I never would have been a Pharisee back then. I would have been a Pharisee killer back then, you know. (laughs) I would have been against the Pharisees. I would have recognized it. And yet I think we likely all have multiple areas of our lives where we choose to be blind. Where we think the truth will hurt too much. Where we have put too much on the line going in one direction because we don't really want to know anymore if that's actually the right way. Because to have to turn around and retrace our steps would be too painful. You know, there were, um, when I lived in Chicago, there were, there, were, there were two people that I was qu- acquaintances with. They were both believers. They were both in the church. Um, and they had at one point been the best of friends. And they used to spend, their family spent time together. They, they kind of grew up in the faith together. And then one day, one of the friends said to the other friend, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. I don't want you to call me anymore. I don't want to be in a relationship with you anymore. All right, and this came completely out of the blue to the other friend. All right, so there's there's a lot of problems with this, okay? And so I'm not trying to assign blame to one or the other, but certainly one of the friends was absolutely blind to the impact that he was having on the other friend. He could not see what he was doing or what his impact was. And he should have seen it. It was years in the making. Many people tried to tell him. They tried to tell him softly. They tried to tell him directly. They tried to tell him with great gentleness. And there were people who told him without any tact at all. Many different, many different ways were chosen. Try and get him to listen. In a myriad of instances, He had people trying to tell him something that he chose not to see. All right? And that's an extreme extreme case, of course. Um, But this happens in many ways in life. When people are surprised that they're getting fired. All right? There's a lot of people who are surprised that they got fired and nobody else is. (laughs) All right? 
when, when our kids leave the home, and then once they leave the home, they start living in unbe- unimaginably wild ways, and they don't want to come home anymore. And the parents are like, we could have never seen this coming. And all of that guy's friends were like, we saw it coming from a thousand miles away. Sometimes people get divorced and it's surprising to one person over the other. There are so many scenarios when people feel blindsided by something, but it's because they chose to be blind. It is a kind of folly. You know, the truth, the truth is hard. Truth is something that is unyielding. It can be sharp, and it can be very, very hard. The truth can advocate for us, but the truth can also injure us. And for that reason, we sometimes avoid the truth, because we don't want to be injured. But if we make it a habit of avoiding the truth, it at some point becomes an unconscious habit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like there are some things you did on purpose at first, and then you started doing them so much that now you don't even know that you do them. All right? I I had to learn how to laugh. I I, I always always could smile, and I kind of had this this horrible laugh. And it was just kind of like, uh, almost like just a low-grade moan. Or I was, I would just go, uh, <laughs> and I didn't, I, I was just like, it, it's horrible. People would make fun of me. And then when I started speaking and I would laugh at my own jokes, then it was like amplified <laughs> and recorded. And I decided I had to learn, I had to learn how to laugh like a normal human being. <laughs> and so I practiced my laugh, you know, and. And, and, I, and I started laughing, like I would, ha- I, I practiced a belly laugh, and I practiced a loud laugh, and I practiced a, you know, more quiet laugh, and, and, and all of this I, I practiced over, and I forced myself to do it, and now I laugh like a normal person, completely unconscious of it. Now, I think it's normal, you may not think it's normal, but um, here's the thing, those unconscious habits, they take over over time. I think the, the laughing, that, that's, a, that's a good habit. But some of our habits are bad. Some of our habits of lying become unconscious habits. To the point where we don't know that we're even lying anymore. We don't even know that we're reacting. We become blind, we've chosen blindness, and we've become unaware of it again. The habit of self-preservation will take over in your life if you don't consciously oppose it at times. And this is when we truly become fools. Fools cannot see their own folly because their folly has become nearly an unconscious choice to them. It takes moments of tremendous stress and pain then at that point before we start recognizing our blindness. You know, I read a story, a minister, um, he told the story how uh, he never wore his seatbelt. He actually resented the idea that he had to wear a seatbelt. And he had grown up at a time where, you know, wearing a seatbelt wasn't the law. It was just, you could choose to wear it or not to wear it. And he was just one of those guys, if you tell him what to do, he wants to do the opposite. And so he, uh, he just, he would never wear it. The only time he would wear a seatbelt is if he was in a car that would incessantly make a noise if you didn't wear your seatbelt, like the car that I have. Sometimes when I drop my wife off, she takes her seatbelt off like 45 seconds before I've stopped the car. And so then we all have to endure the warning bell for that amount of time, you know. Um, he's like, so I would put my seatbelt on in those instances or if I was driving with my wife for the exact same reason as the incessant bell. And uh, he, said, he said, at one point, I was at my house and one of the members of the church called me and said that their daughter had been in an accident a mile from our house and if I could run over there because it was a bad accident. And he's like, so I went over there and uh, her daughter was in the hospital. She had some injuries, but she was okay. But there was a body on the street covered up with a blanket. And it was her boyfriend. And her boyfriend, they, w- they were in a ragtop Jeep. And he didn't have his seatbelt on. 
and he was thrown from the car, and then the car rolled over him, and he died instantly. And uh, he said that moment of trauma was the thing that I needed to begin to consciously put my seatbelt on. He goes, it's, and it's interesting, it's not like I learned anything new. I knew all the stats about seatbelts. I knew the law. I knew, I, I knew everything. But it, I had to experience a type of stress and trauma before it got me to stop being a fool. Is that the path you want to travel yourself? And I'm sure some of us are well down that path in very specific areas of our lives already. Most normal people do not want to learn things the hard way. No one enjoys hitting rock bottom for the purpose of having their eyes opened. But that's, that's the path some of us are on right now. Where it will take a moment of unbelievable stress or trauma before we will learn our, listen, our lesson. You know, but we don't want that, right? That's not what we want. So how, how do we get to the point where we're willing to look at ourselves? Where we're willing to take, uh, you know, where, where we, how can we escape our blindness? I was listening to uh, a lecture the other day, and it was by a guy who had spent his entire life studying uh, nutrition. And the talk was about the link between chronic illness and chronic disease and, and what we eat. And he's, he's a specialist in, in trying to um, attack illnesses through, through nutrition. All right, so instead of through, if we, if we can avoid some of the more toxic drugs that sometimes we have to take in order to kill diseases, he's trying to figure out that there's got to be ways to just eat a certain way that will strengthen our immune system, whatever. That's his whole thing. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a scientist. Um, but at one point, and he's, he's talking to a U.S. crowd, at one point, the, the discussion goes to the idea of weight loss. And right away, I could tell that this guy did not want to talk about this. Like, he, his specialty was in disease. But because he's a nutritionist, people are asking, they, they start pressing him on, like, questions on, like, well, you know, what kind of foods and what kind of diets are good for for, for losing weight. And after a, li a little prodding, he reluctantly answered the question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to answer the way that, that this isn't verbatim, but this is kind of what he said. He, he basically said, I don't love to discuss this subject because people are emotional about it and tend to be offended by my answer. I don't attend, intend to give any insult. The problem is, is that people want a more complicated answer to an issue like weight loss when the answer is very, very simple. If you consume more calories than you burn, you gain weight. <laughs> if you burn more calories than you consume, you lose weight, period. It's a lifestyle of calorie deficit, and that's it. And that was his answer. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, okay? I think some of us, we, we, might, we might hate that answer, all right? Now, here's the thing I want to say. There's a reason why we hate that answer. I'm not going to tell you what it is for you, okay? <laughs> I've already got a terrible ending planned, and so I don't want to go down any other, <laughs> any other, any other paths here that will make you upset with me. But I bring this up because it brings up something that, that is representative in most of us, is that we don't like simple answers because it puts the responsibility of the problem on us. We like answers to be super complicated, all right? Complicated answers relieve us of some amount of responsibility. Complicated answers allow us to claim victimhood to things that are out of our control. And if you are someone who suspects that they might be blind in some glare, glaring areas of your life, if you notice that people who know you are pointing out similar observations to you, but you keep rejecting what they're saying and it's causing friction, if you keep falling into the same pit over and over again and cannot see why, if you want to make sure that you are really seeing the reality around you and are not walking blindly from one folly to another, then you may not like the simplicity of the solution. Because simple doesn't mean easy. Simple usually means hard. John 8, 31 says this, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. 
then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The answer to blindness is Jesus. Listen to what he teaches. Then obey what he teaches for a long period of time. Then you will begin to see and experience life differently. And you will start to see the truth. And then you will begin to become free of your blindness. Now, I can imagine what might be going through some of your minds right now, because I know what I'd be tempted to think. I've had to sit through this entire service just to hear that. (laughs) You could have just gotten up here and said, the answer is Jesus, and then sat back down, and then we could have all gone to lunch. (laughs) Or maybe you're thinking, what do you think I've been doing for these last number of years? I'm trying to follow Jesus, but it's not helping. Or, if it was so simple, no one would struggle with all of this. Genius. (laughs) I meant that literally, not sarcastically. (laughs) Remember, simple's not easy to do. It's just easy to understand what to do. There are two things I really love to do in this life. Now, there's many things, but there's two that I, I... at present life, give me a great deal of joy. And you've heard me mention them probably almost every sermon. One of them, probably every other sermon. And one is I really like to go fly fishing, and the other is I really like to run. Do you know what's funny? I'm not very good at either of them. (laughs) I'm just not. I'm not a very good fly fisher, and I'm not a very good runner. I've been running consistently for a pretty long time now. Last year, I ran over a thousand miles during the year, and I still stink at running. (laughs) I'm not good at long distance running. It can be so frustrating to put so much effort into something and still struggle to be decent at it. I've been to the doctor to look at my heart because I was like, maybe something's wrong with my heart. (laughs) You know, and I was hoping the doctor would say, oh yeah, you've got this enlarged blah, 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 and here's a drug, and now you'll be able to start running much easier, and there's nothing wrong with my heart. And and I was kind of hoping that maybe I had some lung thing going on. And uh, they're like, nope, you don't have any breathing problems. Your lungs are operating at maximum. You've got very good lungs. You've got a very good heart, and you've got very good lungs. I think I just don't like pain. That's part of it. (laughs) Running hurts. There's a, there's, there's, there's a part of things where you go, this just sh- should stop hurting at some point. But it doesn't stop hurting. Every really good runner I've ever known says the same thing. You have to keep running, and you have to keep running more. And you have to learn to endure more. And then you become a better runner. I've never been an amazing runner. But you know what? I'm well beyond where I started. When I, when I started running. And because I simply love to run, I'm content to make small incremental gains year by year. If you love Jesus, you will hold to his teaching. And his word will take a soft place, it will find a soft place to land. And incrementally, things will change. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. The cure for blindness is Jesus. There is no trick. Yet perhaps this insight from Jesus about listening and hearing could help. And in this, Jesus had just told the parable of the sower. And uh, and the Pharisees, they didn't didn't like the parable. And they're always like, Jesus, we feel like you're talking about us in a negative way. And Jesus is always like, Your instincts are correct. (laughs) And uh, his disciples come up to him and say, hey, the Pharisees are not liking what you're saying. And in Matthew 13, verse 14, it says, in them, the Pharisees, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. 
Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And then he goes on to explain the parable of the sower in more depth. And he explains why some people never see. They're like, because my words, for some people, they're so ignorant and they want to stay ignorant and there's no depth to them. And so my words can't take hold. They're not willing to learn more. And some people are caught up and they're so caught up in what the world thinks that even though my words might bring them joy, any pushback from the world steals that joy. And my words can't take hold. And some people are so enticed by the allure of wealth, of ease, of influence, of power. And the word is choked out by the desires in their heart and by their temptations. And my word cannot take hold. He goes, but there are some people who are truly humble and willing and deep. And they find, and the word finds a place in their heart to take hold where it eventually bears fruit. The heart with good soil finds out what this means for themselves. You know, that's the thing about parables. Jesus says a parable, and then he doesn't really explain it super well. He wants you to figure it out for yourself. Don't you wish he said, and these are the five things you have to do to have good soil in your heart. He doesn't. He says, but that's where you have to get to. I think the reason he does is because we're all so different. If he gave five reasons, it wouldn't work for everybody. So he says, you have to figure it out. If you don't want to be blind, I'm your answer, and you have to figure out how the word takes hold in your heart.